Hello, it's Wednesday, February 24th, and this is Student Affairs Live, the online learning community for student affairs educators in higher education. I am Heather Shea Gasser from Michigan State University. And I'm Tony Duty from Rutgers University. And today we are connecting with ATPA convention organizers and leaders, giving you a sneak peek of the upcoming convention in Montreal. You can participate in this learning community today by following along on Twitter and tweeting to the, tweeting to the Higher Ed Live hashtag. Thanks to our good friend Valerie Haruska for monitoring Student Affairs Live back channel today. And thanks to our Michigan State Student Affairs Practicum student, Alex Sylvester, for all their great work in preparation for today's episode. Before we get on with the episode, we need to recognize our sponsors. Student Affairs Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network, where free live webcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in student affairs. You can tune in to Student Affairs Live every other Wednesday with Tony and I at 1 o'clock Eastern Time or visit our archives at any time. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with education institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. Are you preparing for a website redesign project? Knowing that your website needs an overhaul isn't usually the problem. Getting started is. Download M. Stoner's helpful seven-step checklist to get you started on the right path for a successful website redesign. Student Affairs Live is also exclusively sponsored by ACPA, College Student Educators International. ACPA's strategic partnership with Higher Ed Live calls attention to the pairing of innovative professional development delivery with the strength of a renowned professional association. Now on to today's show. We hope everyone attending the ACPA 2016 convention in less than two weeks, I might add, is watching or listening to this preview episode to learn how to best plan your schedule and connect with others, engage in new learning, and the experiences in Montreal. If you can't make it to the convention in person, stay with us till the end of the episode and we'll tell you how you can enter into a raffle for a free 2016 ACPA digital pass. All right. So getting on with our guest today, thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to have each of you introduce yourselves. So in your introductory remarks, um, we would like you to briefly tell us three things. First, uh, your name and your role relative to the convention. Two, what you do when you're not planning a major convention. And then three, how many pairs of shoes you plan to bring to Montreal this year. So we're going to start with Chris. Hi, all. Uh, thanks, Heather and Tony, first for having us on, on Higher Ed Live to share all things ACPA 16. Uh, my name is Chris Moody, and I've had the honor of serving uh, for the past 18 months as the 2016 convention chair. Uh, the job that uh, pays the bills is uh, serves as a, the assistant vice president at American University in the Office of Campus Life. Uh, pairs of shoes, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to admit, but I, I will. I'm going to bring four pairs of shoes, two that are uh, comfortable and two that are not so comfortable. Good call. Um, Cindy, you'll go to you next. Hi. Thanks very much for having us today. Um, you know, I'm the executive director at ACPA, and this is the most incredible experience we have all year because our community gathers. And for me, it's all about extraordinary welcome. What can we do to make sure everybody feels great being there, has a fantastic time, and most of all knows how much we appreciate them and all the volunteers who contributed to this and our staff uh, for it to be just fabulous. And I am bringing three pairs of shoes. Excellent. <laughs> Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Chang. I'm the Equity and Inclusion Advisory Board Chair for the ACPA 2016 Convention Team. Um, when I'm not doing the convention work, I am a doctoral candidate from the University of Maryland in the Student Affairs concentration there. Shoes, I'm right now in between about four to five. Uh, you just never know what will happen. <laughs> yep. Yep. Rich. Take yourself off. There you go. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Rich Arek. Uh, premièrement, bonjour à tous et merci d'être avec nous. Uh, good day to all, and thank you very much for uh, being here and uh, for this opportunity. Um, so my role is the chair of the Canadian Advisory Board, and that's really a board that was put together for guiding and advising in the conversation about coming to Canada, being international, 
um, as well as having a support logistics role in terms of making ACPA a success here in Canada. Uh, we had uh, liaison roles that uh, also joined in on the uh, uh, on the CAB, um, and we tried to have a cross section of uh, uh, folks from across Canada and across higher education or post secondary education represented uh, on the CAB. When not planning conventions, I'm uh, Associate Director of Services for Students at McGill University in Montreal, um, and that has all of the stuff that comes with being an Associate Director in terms of strategic planning, putting out fires, and uh, dealing with day-to-day uh, -day and uh, international liaison, community liaison, um, and uh, McGill community liaison. Yes, for the number of shoes, well, I'm lucky enough to be in Montreal, so I only get to bring one, and they're called shoe boots. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. All right, nice. Rachel, finally. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Beach. I'm working with special events at this year's convention, um, which I'm very, very excited about. We have an awesome slate of special events this year. Um, in my day job, I'm the Senior Director for International Enrollment Management and Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Admissions at the University of Arizona. Um, so I'm beyond thrilled we're going to be outside of the United States for the first time this year. Um, in terms of shoes, I have right now narrowed it down to nine pairs, but I'm hoping to get down to six. I knew there'd be somebody that was probably <laughs> going to be close to where I am, so I think I'm about nine or so, too. So. Oh. All well, right. Tell me how many it. shoes are you bringing. I'm bringing my sneakers and my dress shoes. That's it. Pack and light. All right. He gets the, he gets the award for the fewest <laughs> amount of shoes. Exactly. Who's here? All right. So, so Chris, can you give us an overview of the convention planning process? I, I know you served on other convention teams. Can you tell us when you started planning? How was the team chosen? What What is different in particular about this Montreal experience? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Tony. Uh, so for me, planning for this uh, Montreal convention actually started uh, three years ago when I attended the Canadian Association of College and University Student Services Conference when it was held in Montreal. Um, we probably may, we may refer to the Canadian Association as caucus um, and when we speak and so when we say caucus we are referring to the Canadian Association. Um, and so when I was there at that conference it really gave me an incredible opportunity to meet many of the fantastic caucus members that have been involved in this convention planning process, uh, but also to take a sneak peek at the hotels and the Palais de Congrès uh, Convention Center, which is where we'll be located. Uh, in just, uh, I guess, a little over a week. Uh, and then in 2014, uh, summer 2014, uh, I was honored to be selected as the convention chair. Uh, we then sent out an all call to all ACPA members, uh, an open call for involvement to apply to be a part of this convention team. Uh, we got over 100 applications, and so we're completely overwhelmed with interest in being a part of the team, which really was a, a good first indicator uh, that there was great interest in this convention particularly, um, and that lots of folks wanted to be involved in, in the good work. So we held uh, interviews for folks that were uh, interested in the steering team roles, and the, the steering team, the central steering team, are really the committee chairs, um, and they then work with committees to deliver on different aspects of convention planning. Um, and so across the team, we really look to create a diverse uh, set of individuals with folks that have had years of experience, uh, but those that were also maybe new to ACPA or new to convention planning, so that we create a pipeline for future leadership. One of the things that I think has uh, that happens with um, people start thinking ahead about conventions and uh, you know getting interested in being a part of a team is that by the time we're in. Um, we're in Tampa last year for ACP 2015, the team was already selected. And so folks have to look probably a little bit more than a year out uh, if they want to be interested in the convention team. Uh, so we've tried to connect folks that have uh, expressed interest since then in other volunteer opportunities. Um, looking at what makes this Montreal convention unique or different, um, uh, obviously this is, and most significantly, ACPA's very first convention outside of the United States in the over 92 year history of the association. Um, this team is, has intentionally focused on what that means uh, in our planning process. Um, we hope that it will be uh, more international in focus in the curriculum. Um, and we realized pretty early on uh, the, that um, higher education, particularly in the United States, focuses is in a, a very U.S.-centric um, way. And so we've, we've really tried to challenge um, folks throughout the planning process on the convention team, through program proposals, to think more globally about their approach um, to, to student support, student learning, and development. And so I think people will really see that um, 
um, people, I think, begin to step away from U.S.-centric biases um, in approaching their work and, and how they deliver their content uh, at convention. We've also wanted to, to be really careful to be respectful of and reflective of our location, Montreal and Quebec. Um, and so it's really easy, I think, to go to a convention and it could be in you know one city versus another. People never really leave the convention center or the hotels. Um, this is one where we particularly believe it's important to immerse yourself in the location and, and the learning that's possible through there. Uh, and so there, there are several opportunities that, that I think that we have designed uh, convention to help people um, be respectful of and engage with the environment. Um, so those are some, some particular ways I think that this uh, convention stands out. And I'd absolutely be remiss not to, to thank Caucus um, for their leadership and support and partnership and collaboration through this last 18 months of planning. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, Cindy, many of our viewers have attended lots of different conferences over the course of their career. Um, and in your view, what distinguishes the ACPA convention from most others? And, and also, how has ACPA evolved to change with the times? Well, of course, Chris Moody is our chair, so that is, speaks for itself. He's extraordinary, so I really am so grateful to his team. But a couple of things. Um, our investment and use of cutting-edge technology at this convention is the highest in our history. Um, and I think uh, that'll be felt throughout all of the activities, whereas in the past it probably was centered in the areas where uh, people needed to access specific things programmatically. I think the other thing is we're launching uh, multiple new member service platforms at this convention that people will be seeing. Uh, ACPA Grow, ACPA Connect, My Portfolio, our new Salesforce membership uh, support platform. So that'll feel differently in some cases. Uh, also, choosing the out of US location, as Chris said, I think has really uh, compelled us to have a much deeper and more challenging level of introspection about diversity, equality, and inclusion. In Student Affairs, we talk a lot about border crossings, but intentionally going out of the USA makes that conversation very real in terms of uh, understanding and impact. And it really creates a lot of dialogue about undocumented persons, freedom of movement from nation to nation, the lives of native, aboriginal, and indigenous people, the experiences of those persons whose sexuality and gender identity is unprotected by national laws, both in the United States and in Canada. Um, all of those things, along with language, cultural variance, currency, standards for the profession, really create this sort of crucible for learning that I don't think we've ever experienced before. So I'm very, very excited uh, about that. The other thing is we have our new elders in residence program. So we will have four persons representing um, Native people within the area where we are, are landing. And I think for us, um, for example, the Ganawake Mohawk group that was right in the area where we will be uh, in the convention center, uh, two of their elders will be with us and two from other areas in Canada. Uh, really sharing the entire week with us, not just an opening and closing. And I think that's going to have a very significant impact. And then finally, the Global Student Leadership Summit, which is happening for the first time this year at convention. Students uh, coming from South Africa, Turkey, Asia, Europe, and participating in a partner program between IASIS, our International Student Affairs Association, LEAD 365, and ACPA. So wherever you go, you're going to have a sense that the world is really uh, all with us. And I think that's going to be just amazing. Thank you. Can't wait. So for each one of you, and, and we'll go in reverse order starting with Rachel this time, what is the one thing that you are most looking forward to at ECPA in Montreal? Uh, 
Wow. Okay. So going first means I get the whole pick of the, the event. <laughs> I, you know, ACPA is, is my professional home. And so I'm always enthused with the whole thing. But this year, I'm especially looking forward to celebrate CPA. I think we have a really cool setup this year. We've got an opportunity to engage uh, Montreal and, and learn about Montreal at that event in addition to all of our entity groups. And I, I think it's going to be a really exciting opportunity. Good. Oh, wow. Hard to say one thing, but I think being part of the first ever, um, hosting ACPA in this beautiful city and having such a great organization, association, bring all this knowledge and experience here, really an amazing opportunity for the field of student affairs and services in Canada and Quebec. Great. Stephanie? Yeah, I mean, like Rich said, it's really hard to say one thing, but I, you know, the one thing I look forward to most at convention is connecting with people who I and colleagues, friends with um, across the country um, and internationally, um, and in particular for this convention, we've worked with so many different folks from all over the all over different areas of Canada and the U.S. In particular, that I'm really connect, looking forward to seeing people in person that I've been talking to for 18 months over email or by phone. Um, so I'm looking forward to the people. Nice, Cindy. I think uh, just watching everybody come through the door the first time is the most extraordinary experience. There's so much energy, it's just like a lift, and uh, that's that's the best part for me. And Chris? Yeah, this is, this is an impossible question, but <laughs> uh, the thing I want to comment on that, that really stands out to me is just the quality of the programs um, that are scheduled in this curriculum uh, is 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 mind-boggling. Um, we many of you may have heard that we had a record number of submissions this year, uh, which allowed us to be much more focused on on quality of, of proposals and submissions. And if if you've looked through the slate of of, uh, of the schedule of programs, our, it has been our goal to make sure that you had at least two or three that you were torn about attending in each of each ed session. And so we're sorry that we're creating some some forced choices for folks, but it's a part of what we wanted to do to really focus on quality. Um, and a part of that is the featured educational sessions. Uh, so there's basically a, a keynote within every ed session. Um, the, the folks that are presenting during those, those ed sessions, um, there's one selected each time that could be an opening or closing session by itself. Um, and so we're really excited about those featured educational sessions and just the high quality of all the programs that, that are in store. Wow, it's gonna be, we're going to be like kids in a candy store. We're not going to know what to pick, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, I love that pachaka cha that Tony did. I think if anybody hasn't seen it, they should go look it up. Um, so, Rachel, this is the... Um, you know, often for many folks, the first time they've been to ACPA. So these these next four questions are designed for those of you watching who have never been to, who are first time attendees. Um, so I'm going to go through some basic stuff. We've gotten a good question from Twitter as well, um, so we'll integrate that. So first, when does convention officially begin? There's lots of things that happen before, during, um, and where do I need to be? So officially, convention kicks off with opening, which will be at 6.30 on Sunday, March 6th. Doors for that will open about 6 o'clock p.m. Um, so we do want folks to be there for that. We've got, um, you know, it's, it's a, as Cindy mentioned, it's a celebratory environment. It's a chance to reconnect. So it's a great time to kind of find people and see them for the first time at convention. Um, and check-in and registration for convention will be ahead of that. So you do want to make sure you have your name badge and you're ready to go and settled in. Um, so for sure, be there by 6 p.m on Sunday, March 6th. Great. So our next um, question has to do with all these different things that ACP has that are unique. Um, so you've already talked a little bit about Celebrate ACPA, but in a quick sentence, talk about Celebrate ACPA, Culture Fest, Pachaka Cha, and Genius Labs. And a then quick I'll, sentence? A quick <laughs> sentence. Like, what are each of those things? <laughs> sure. So um, I, I think overall, these are the signature programs that make ACPA convention different than a lot of other conventions, uh, both specific and kind of globally focused in terms of student affairs and services. Um, so Celebrate ACPA is a time to connect with entity groups and also, in this case, a chance to connect with the city of Montreal. Again, a great place to, to do that social networking, see your friends you haven't seen in a year or longer, um, and make new friends as well, and get in, start finding out ways to get involved with ACPA broadly. 
Um, Culture Fest is put on for our, um, by our Coalition for Multicultural Affairs. They put on an event that really celebrates something specific to the cultures that are involved and supported by ACPA. This year they're focusing on a global perspective and are bringing in a Canadian spoken word artist. Um, which is again a great and exciting opportunity to learn a little bit more about social justice and cultures in Canada and specifically to Quebec and Montreal. Um, Pachacacha is a really exciting evening of 20 slides and 20 seconds, 6 minutes and 40 seconds if I'm doing that math properly, um, with a whole bunch of dynamic speakers talking on things that they're passionate about. Um, from both directly in student affairs to things that they're passionate and outside of student affairs. Um, great way to learn from some of the most dynamic um, speakers in our field and all member speakers. Um, and then Genius Labs, these are opportunities for you to learn a little bit about something new that you can then take home. So this could be technology focused, it could be uh, what is Snapchat and how do you use it or Twitter or all those kind of good things and it gives you those little moments to get some training and some practical application on all these things that folks talk about that maybe you either haven't had an opportunity to be exposed to or know about but aren't sure how you could incorporate it into your work. Okay, next question. How do I meet people? I'm the only person coming from my institution. Um, how do I meet people? Um, so the first thing I would suggest in terms of meeting people is just saying hi. The reality is this is an extraordinarily friendly group of people. Um, so as you sit down next to folks in sessions at opening, introduce yourself, say hello, um, find something to talk about. We're all in the profession of working with students, so there's something in common you have with absolutely everybody in that space. Um, you can also then get involved, go to Celebrate CPA as I mentioned, you'll meet the entity groups and the leadership, they're all very outgoing and want to talk with you. Um, go to socials, go to sessions, just, just say hi, be friendly, wear a smile, that all helps. Awesome. So you mentioned socials and receptions. Um, are these open? What's the protocol? Sure. So ACPA has lots and lots of socials. There's um, money competing socials um, across every single evening. And so generally speaking, unless it's specifically outlined that it is not open, it is in fact open. So um, go, especially if it's something that you want to connect with an institution or an entity group that you want to be a part of, those are things to just attend. Say, again, walk in, say hi, feel like you can be there, don't feel like you can't be there unless the session says something to the effect of closed or by invitation only. Those would be the only exceptions to that. Great. So Cindy, in um, your remarks, we had a question based about the what you mentioned ACPA Connect. Andy Gilbert um, has asked, um, what is ACPA Connect? He's, he's new to ACPA. Hi, Andy. So um, about 16 months ago, we started working on a project to automate the platform that matched mentees and mentors in a long-standing program in ACPA called ACPA Grow. And in developing that platform, we went out and licensed some technology that was actually being used by the White House in My Brother's Keeper program that allows mentees to search mentors based on their skill sets and interests and then request an appointment to spend time with them. And that platform then allowed us to create a whole other layer or aspect of that where people throughout the ACPA community who provide uh, consultation to one another or to schools in particular areas, let's just say Title IX for example, you're looking for the people in the country who are doing particular things in Title IX. ACPA Connect has uh, profiles of those individuals, so then you can go in and connect with them and request an appointment and schedule that. And so it's two different aspects of the same platform that we'll be introducing at convention. Awesome. Thanks so much for responding to that. For any of you who have questions who are watching today, definitely send us a tweet at Higher Ed Live or the hashtag Higher Ed Live, and we will incorporate that into our show. Now, Stephanie, when Often when first year students come to college, they suffer from what we call the, the first year 15, right? And I, and I think there's potentially a, a parallel con national convention five pound uh, in increase as, as we come. And these days can be grueling, right? We're getting up early, we're going to sessions all day, we have socials, there are special events at night. I mean, potentially there are 16, 18 hour days sometimes. Do you have any tips for us on, on how to keep balance and, and stay healthy while at convention? Yeah, I mean, you know, convention for anyone who's introverted or extroverted can be really overwhelming. Um, 
And there's definitely things to, to do while you're at convention in Montreal that um, hopefully what we've set up some uh, things that will help folks. Um, so, you know, hydrate is important. Um, so bring a water bottle um, so you can refill that water bottle at different um, watering stations or anywhere that where you, where you can hydrate. So that would be really important. Rest, take breaks. Um, so there are underground tunnels if you are in some certain hotels. And if you aren't, you know, make sure that you know what route you're taking from <clears throat> the convention center to wherever your hotel might be or wherever you're located in terms of where you're staying so that you can take a break. And if you're you're too far away or you're, you know, looking, thinking, I don't really want to walk all the way back to my hotel room, there is a reflection space that we have offered um, for attendees. It's in the Palais 443. Um, that's one way where you could, you could go sit in a quiet space, think about, you know, what is it you have coming up next, think about um, what is it you've learned, um, or just really take a moment to yourself. Um, there's also a space for folks who may need a lactation room um, that's also on the, on the fourth floor of the Palais. So there's definitely a lot of different ways to stay healthy, um, but the most important thing is to know what are your limits and boundaries when you go into a, a convention such as this where there's so many different educational opportunities and social opportunities to engage with other folks. Um, eating healthy is really important. The Palais is located in a really prime location. Um, so we're really close to Chinatown and so many other eateries. There's also some eateries within the Palais itself. Um, so know, you know, one, get an experience that is different from what you may normally have. Have some poutine if you can, um, if that's something that you're, you're willing to do. Um, but, you know, learn about what, what is Montreal culture and engage in that aspect as well as a way to get away from the convention a little bit. Um, so there's many, many different ways and you can rejuvenate through uh, exercising if that's something that SA Fit is really popular with, with many folks. Um, so I don't know if going for a run outside is, is maybe the best way at this point in time in Montreal, but some folks may want to do that. That may be a way to kickstart uh, some energy. Um, but there are Zumba classes, yoga breaks uh, that different entity groups are offering. Um, so make sure you look at that as well. Or find a friend. Maybe you've met someone new and ask them to coffee. Um, so sometimes small groups might work best for you, but large groups also might work best as well. Uh, the nice thing about convention is that you can be both personable and invisible at the same time. Um, it really has something for everyone. Great, thank you. Those are great suggestions. Um, so I personally have a little bit of a fear of missing out, hashtag FOMO. Um, and so I'm curious what each of you have as your don't miss event. So um, what is, what's the thing if I am, have that fear that I, shouldn't, I should make sure I put on my schedule? Um, so we're gonna start with Chris. Sure, again, so many things I could list. Um, I'll highlight again the featured educational sessions. We're going to have a panel of, of three sitting college presidents talking about student affairs. Um, we have the um, authors of the third volume of How College Affects Students uh, panel. Uh, we've got uh, multiple panels on uh, student activism and student voice, uh, which makes me think about our common read. Uh, the ACV Common Read in Defiance. Um, it's a text by uh, um, Gabriel Nadeau Dubois um, about the 2012 Maple Spring protests um, in Montreal and Quebec uh, against tuition hikes. Um, and so I, I know that many campuses are, are working with students on student activism, student voice, um, and the Common Read just provides an incredible parallel. Um, and so we're holding two discussion groups or reading uh, discussion groups uh, for folks that will, will read in defiance before they get to Montreal um, and, and look forward to having those conversations. I think it's going to be really interesting to draw parallels between what happened in Montreal and Quebec in 2012 and what's happening on, on many campuses today. Great. Rachel. Um, in terms of my Don't Miss event, oh gosh, I probably would say Pachaka Cha. And I say that because I went two years ago and then I missed it last year and I definitely felt I missed it. And it's just a, it's a different way of learning and it's a different way of thinking. And you see people, these speakers, in a totally different light than you would in an educational session. And so that's probably my Don't Miss event. Awesome. Stephanie. Yeah, so I'm going to give a, a nod here to Higher Ed Live because my, my Don't Miss an event is the Contested Issues um, on, uh, I believe it's on Tuesday uh, at 12.30, yes. if I'm not mistaken. Um, I, you know, in particular, I'm most excited for the head-to-head -head between Gretchen Messler and Susan, Dr. Susan Jones. Um, that, that one in particular, I think, really hits home in terms of the, the practitioner and scholar 
uh, d dimensions. Um, so I, I think that one's going to be really, really exciting. Um, and I, I wish it could go for more than just one hour, actually. And I haven't even been there yet. <laughs> Yeah, Tony and I are really excited about it. We're going to talk a little bit more about that at the end, but that's going to be definitely a something we neither of us will be missing out on for sure. Um, Rich. Oh wow! I think uh, don't miss event, the convention itself, the whole thing. Um, if I were to narrow things down, I think uh, Kachaka Cha uh, Genius Labs. I, I love those. Um, seeing people see, and then making new connections. I think those are the things that. Uh, don't want to miss out on. Great. And then finally, Cindy. For me, because I have a lot of meetings while I'm there too, layered with everything else, so for me the opening and the closing become sort of the um, just the harmony of the whole thing for me. And uh, I'm relatively new to ACPA and to student affairs as a profession, and those two experiences sort of lift up the voice and witness of ACPA to social justice, to scholarship, uh, to the translation of scholarship to practice. And so if I can help it, I would never miss those. Great. So Rachel, I know that you're um, involved with some of these different groups, so I thought this would be a good question for you. Um, there seems to be a lot of business meetings for various groups like commissions and coalitions. And if I'm a new person to ACPA and I want to get involved, um, how do I go about accessing those? Can I, can I just show up? Sure. So um, I think probably one of the most unique things about ACPA is ACPA is run by volunteers at all kind of levels. We have an international office and they're fabulous, but much of the work that gets done in ACPA is done by volunteers. And that happens both through convention team but also through our coalitions, our um, commissions, and our state and international divisions. And so. These are opportunities for you to get involved, and I would say absolutely every one of them want more folks directly involved with their directorate membership. Um, generally speaking, you're going to see meetings for all of these groups during convention. Again, unless it specifically says the meeting is closed or by invitation only, attend, because that's an opportunity to hear what's happening within that particular group, an opportunity to learn about how to become involved, um, an opportunity to see what's priorities of that of that particular group. I'm involved with one of the commissions and at our open meeting we're going to talk about and solicit ideas for things that our membership want to see us do over the course of the year for webcasts, for um, our blog posts, for things um, really associated with the, the work that our uh, commission specifically does. But we also honor our awardees, so our, those folks who have done something outstanding in our field, so it gives folks a chance to meet people who are doing outstanding work at campuses across the world, really, um, and a chance to, to, to learn about how they can fit into either becoming more involved as a general member or even taking the next step of a leadership position in, a, in part of a directorate um, for one of those entity groups. So show up. That's usually my advice to most things. Show up because somebody's going to say hi and somebody's going to ask you to get involved. Absolutely. Great advice. Thanks. Now, Rich, as a Montreal native, can you give us some suggestions of things outside the convention experience we should be sh absolutely sure that we should check out while we're in town? Absolutely. I think the, the word in Montreal is explore. Um, Montreal is a cultural and food hub, a center, a metropolis, if you will. Um, it is a UNESCO designated site for its architecture. Um, we will be celebrating our 375th uh, year next year as an established city. Uh, Montreal, as Stephanie uh, had said before, is famous for poutine, um, for bagels, for smoked meat, and for a, a meat pie dish called tourtière. Uh, I, I invite people, to, if, if they can, to, 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 to try some of those. Uh, sugar shacking is uh, is huge, and, and March is going to be the time where uh, this is going to start. Uh, La Place des Festivals, uh, the place of festivals, uh, which is just up from the convention center. A uh, great place where there's always something going on outside, free shows, um, inside, uh, all kinds of operas and concerts and so forth. There's a festival right now going on called Montréal en Lumière, Montreal in Lights, if you will, and that goes on till the 5th of March. And again, there's there's a ton of activities outside to be done. Um, there's the uh, Quartier de l'Innovation, the Innovation Quarter, which is a, a modern ecosystem designed to be a unifying force, if you will, integrating four segments 
segments uh, essential for a creative society, an industrial segment, an education and research segment, an urban segment, and a social and cultural segment. And these integrations and interconnections are, are, are creating a sort of a world-class uh, innovative uh, ecosystem in Montreal. Um, there's the old port, there's old Montreal, there's the mountain lookout, there's different neighborhoods with their cultural bends, very easy to access. Um, museums. I mean, Montreal is the United Nations, in all honesty. It, it really is one of the most multicultural cities in the world. Uh, and there's so much that, that is happening um, in, in Just Explore. Wow. I, I, my, ex my excitement just quadrupled in, in that. So, so two questions. What is a sugar shack, or what is sugar shacking? <laughs> <laughs> so it's so we have maple syrup, um, and maple syrup is produced on sort of you know forest land, and uh, it it uh, came it, it started uh, becoming uh, they they called it sugar shacking. So uh, uh, what they do is they extract the maple syrup from the trees, um, they cook it so it becomes a syrup and you can eat it. But there's a whole sort of breakfast tradition around it, and it's a quite a specific breakfast tradition. It's in common halls. You're eating with a whole bunch of people that are sitting next to you on these long tables sometimes. Um, it is sort of a buffet style where food just keeps coming out. Um, the, and you put maple syrup basically on anything. So the scrambled eggs, the greens, the uh, the, the bacon, the, the ham. There's also these things that, that are called uh, les oreilles de crise, uh, which are uh, sort of really deep fried pork fat um, and everything accompanied by a healthy dose of, of maple syrup. Then you go out, you do the taffy run, which is maple syrup on snow on a little popsicle stick. Uh, there's usually a farm animals and uh, you go sledding, uh, so a, a sled uh, uh, usually with a, a horse drawn sled, pardon me. Um, and music, uh, good Quebecois, francophone uh, and anglophone music uh, with a slightly Irish bend sometimes. Is everything that you just said somewhere that I can go find it and make a to-do list for, for myself? Is do we have a blog that, or can you write that down and, and so we can share with folks? That I, I believe on the ACPA site, there's quite a lot of stuff that's already there, and and again, it's it's all in the explore sort of uh, dimension. So, uh, but there's a lot of stuff as well. I mean, you know, if if you search on the web, uh, whether it's in tourism Montreal or you just put sugar shacking in Montreal, uh, everything is quite close. I think the uh, the convention center and the hotels, your your 20 minute walk from so many things, and if you want to partake in, in a transportation, uh, you're you know, 30 to 40 minutes out and you are uh, you know, in nature and uh, in a plethora of, of different restaurants and activities that can be had. Love it. Not to forget skating, hockey, etc. Love it. Thanks, Rich. I'm really looking forward to coming. I was there in July, so this will be a whole new experience being there in March, but it's an amazing city. You, you absolutely don't oversell it, Rich. It's, it's a phenomenal place. Um, so, Chris, I know you've spent a lot of time in Montreal and have thought a lot about like navigation and folks getting from place to place, and you might have some recommendations both on kind of that planning process, but also just in general where you've figured out as a, as a visitor um, where are good places to eat based on our time. Sure, yeah, I think there, there are probably three things that might be important for us to talk about is kind of the food, where to, where to get food and uh, how much time to plan for that. And I think we've, we've talk, um, heard people ask a lot of questions about planning ahead and scheduling and how to know how to do that. And then we've had a lot of questions also about weather and how weather um, might intersect with some of those plans. Um, and so we'll start with food. I think um, Stephanie and Rich have both already talked about a number of food resources. But um, if you think about food in terms of just the quick eats, but also kind of the longer term, really uh, cultural immersion opportunity that's there through the food of Montreal. Um, our, our website has, uh, in the Montreal tab, a link that says quick eats, I think, or quick places to eat um, that are um, uh, very convenient um, near uh, or in the Palais de Congrès. So the first floor of our convention center has a number of uh, quick eateries. Um, there is also an underground pedestrian network uh, that's over 20 miles of connecting passageways beneath downtown Montreal uh, that has lots of quick eats, shops, uh, restaurants, grocery stores, uh, things like that that make it super easy and convenient uh, to, to go and, and grab some of those items. So um, 
So we think we got the, the quick eats part taken care of pretty successfully through the, the Palais and the underground pedestrian network. Um, so check out that, that quick eats link on the site. I think uh, uh, Valerie just tweeted that out to our, to our Twitter oh, great. followers today. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. Valerie. If you're, if you're looking for kind of a, a longer sit-down meal with friends and colleagues and networks, um, uh, 70s Highland Chinatown is, is really nearby, and so I would just reiterate that. Um, and also Old Montreal has a number of incredible restaurants uh, just a few blocks uh, from the convention center and the hotels and so if you're looking for a place that's nearby to maybe I would re definitely recommend a reservation uh, from experience there uh, but I would look in the old Montreal section as well as Chinatown uh, for some longer eating um, opportunities. Um, so planning ahead, um, looking, we've, we've put a few resources on the site already. Um, the program book is available as a downloadable PDF uh, on the website. Uh, folks can get the hard copy when they check in if they would like a uh, hard copy. Uh, but we also have it so you can download it and, and bring it with you uh, to convention and start planning ahead about which sessions you'd like to attend. Um, the Crowd Compass uh, app, however, is the easiest way uh, to stay up to date on all of the most recent room locations, date and time changes. Um, and so you can build a schedule for yourself in the Crowd Compass app. Um, and then as a room number changes or a program gets moved, then you can easily have that access at your fingertips because uh, the program book unfortunately has to be printed a little bit before we get there. Um, and so there will be some changes um, that happen on site. And so I would encourage folks to go ahead and, and download the Crowd Compass app. I think Heather's showing it to everyone now. And just search for ACPA 2016 um, as the event, and it'll pull up a schedule. You can see who else is attending. Um, and get maps of um, the different facilities and make it super easy to navigate while we're there. And then I think I said we, I would also talk about weather. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. So the weather forecast right now looks like we're going to be in the upper 20 um, and lower 30 degrees Fahrenheit uh, while we're there. A few potential snow showers. Um, but uh, nothing that's more than looks like right now one to one to two inches um, of snowfall uh, while we're there. Uh, so we're, we're doesn't look like it's blizzard conditions, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, but we do recommend that it, it's going to be winter, and for many people coming, um, this is a different climate, um, particularly for them. Um, and so, bringing coats and uh, you know, Rich said he's bringing I think snow boots or winter boots um, as his shoes. Um, so think about think about winter weather, uh, but knowing that uh, if you're staying at the Westin, the Intercontinental, or the Hyatt hotels. Um, those all are a part of the underground pedestrian network um, that connect with the Palais de Congrès. So uh, if you're staying in one of those hells, you, hotels, you could potentially not go outdoors until you leave again uh, because all of your food, your programs, your receptions, your sessions will all be within a covered um, area. So we really think that folks will make it find it super easy to navigate uh, Montreal and to, to plan ahead for how they're going to just maximize their experience. Awesome. Yeah, I downloaded the program book and, and the app, and I'm already looking at all of the things, and I really love the new format of the program book this year. It looks amazing. Great job. Thanks. Tony, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Rachel, Cindy shared her excitement earlier about the opening and closing se mm -hmm. sessions. Could you share a little bit about each of our keynote speakers uh, and, and what their topics are? Sure. So opening and closing um, are going to be very exciting this year. We have a fabulous slate of speakers, um, many of which are coming from a Canadian perspective, which is, is nice knowing that we're outside of the United States and kind of focusing on where we are and, and to provide more of a global view on student affairs and services. Um, so our opening like it has for the past couple of years, will feature three different speakers, Jack Saddleback, Martin Desjardins, and Jay Smooth. So some three very different perspectives on different elements of education, um, both in Canada and from a, a U.S. social justice perspective. Uh, so Jack Saddleback is currently the president of the University of Saskatchewan Student Union. He's the first transgender and Aboriginal, uh, and the fourth Aboriginal person to hold that role. So he's going to be talking more from a perspective of a current student engaged in the system, but also through the lens of his identities as well. 
Um, Martine Desjardins was a leader in the Maple Sp Spring. She was a student leader at the time and the only student leader who was involved before, during, and after. So she'll be able to give us some perspective. It ties into the common read that we have as well uh, for a convention this year. And then um, Jay Smooth is actually a radio host, so it may be a name that's very familiar to folks, especially in the New York region. Um, he's been hosting a program called the Underground Railroad, which launched in 1991. But he does a lot of work around um, naming social justice, naming um, issues around racism. And so this will be an interesting perspective for us to tie this together kind of on both sides of the border at, at opening and, and looking at it from both the Canadian and US lens, but also then helping to put that in a global perspective. Um, our closing keynote is by Urshad Manji. She's an educator. Um, she works at New York University, but she is Canadian. Um, so she has some really interesting perspectives on Islam and its role in uh, social justice and in global politics and in the United States and in Canada. So it's some really interesting, um, very different perspectives than I think we've seen for a while um, and really focused on not only where we are, but kind of looking at us as a global organization and recognizing that we need to be thinking broader as um, organizers in student affairs. Great. So so we're a question behind on our Twitter and, and uh, Zeb, Zeb Davenport asks, what's the best piece of advice for navigating travel internationally while attending? And I, and I know you've got some great resources up on the site, but as someone who's listening in on the podcast who might be listening to it on their travel to the airport, any any last minute advice? Anyone? I, uh, Sorry, this is Rich. Go ahead, Seth. Oh, well, we're probably going to say really similar things, actually, to be honest. Um, you know, you alluded, Tony, to the, the resources we have on the website, and that, I think, is a good starting point for anybody when they're thinking about traveling to a convention in Montreal at this point being in or outside of Canada. Um, so something we want to be really aware of and something we've talked about as a convention steering team and planning team over these last 18 months is that folks are coming from within Canada and outside of Canada. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really uh, important to acknowledge that you know our attendees are coming from multiple different countries and nationalities. Um, so the travel experiences will be quite different. Um, if you are coming from a US uh, border uh, position, you know, a lot of the resources we have on the site does include um, TSA resources. So the TSA actually has a pretty great frequently asked questions about how to prepare for crossing into Canada. And similarly with the Canadian Border Services Patrol, they have really great resources on their websites as well. Um, but, you know, one thing you want to make sure if you are crossing the international border anywhere is that you have your documentation or passport identification. Um, Current, the you know, money uh, that you may need uh, to travel. Um, so to make sure it's all up to date. Um, we're lucky that in Canada, you know, for the U.S. folks, uh, we don't need to have a valid passport of, you know, like if you're traveling to China, your passport has been valid for a certain number of months before you actually enter, um, or you need a, a permit. And we're really fortunate, it's a huge privilege that for U.S. folks, we can enter into Canada with really not a whole lot of fanfare. Um, just being uh, someone who holds a U.S. passport. So, I mean, the biggest tip I can offer right now is really, you know, look at the travel resources we have, but also on your own, do some of your own investigation of what you might need. Um, a lot of times, I, you know, one of the things we want to make sure we're not doing is giving everyone everything that they may need right away, because part of the experience of traveling internationally is experiencing some of that on, you know, on your own research um, looking on the web, asking people, talking to people about what their travels have been. Um, so some of it we have for you, and then some of it we want you to look for on your own. These are great suggestions. Um, and I think we just tweeted out a link to that international um, resources for traveling. So that um, is really useful as well. Um, so Rich, back to you. Um, as the first ACPA convention outside the US, a number of new opportunities arose for connection and collaboration and learning. Um, and as a Canadian liaison, can you can you talk a little bit about some of those specifically? Maybe we'll highlight the top three since we're running a little short on time. Uh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I think the first thing is is obviously the the differences between Canadian higher education and, and U.S. higher education. But even within Canada, you have Canadian higher education and Quebec higher education. Um, so. 
we have high school up until uh, what we call secondary five, which is about the 11th grade. Then we go into two years of CEGEP, which is the equivalent of a community college for you or college. And there's a couple of different tracks there. Um, whereas in the rest of Canada, they go probably until grade 12, and then they go into four years of university to get a bachelor's. Um, so there's, I think, the highlight of uh, of having a Canadian track also at the, at the convention was really great to be able to ha have a whole bunch of folks from uh, Canada be able to present. Um, I think also the Canadian uh, the the uh, representation that's there. Uh, Cindy had mentioned it, 260 delegates or plus uh, from over 26 countries, and I think we have uh, over 180 Canadian delegates as well. I think that's just amazing uh, in the number of folks that uh, are able to present. Um, Cindy also mentioned the uh, the Global Leader Summit. Uh, student Leader Summit uh, together with ACPA, IASIS, and, and LEAD 365. Um, caucus and the involvement of caucus in there I think is great. And I just want to give a really quick shout out. I think that there's uh, the CEGEP and the two-year college link with the, there's a commission for two-year colleges who have been able to link up. Uh, but there's also a university and CEGEP tour uh, pre-conference tour as well as a QI tour and I think that those are, are, are really great opportunities for folks to to find out a bit more about Canadian and Quebec higher education here. Those are great. Those are great resources and a lot of that is also online. Um, so kind of similarly, um, equity and inclusion are of course foundational values of ACPA and uh, Stephanie, can you talk a little bit about what the points of emphasis are this year and what resources have been identified for folks with any questions they might have. Yeah, I mean, as, as we all know, equity and inclusion is a, is a major value of the association and of any convention. Um, and there's many, many opportunities uh, in Montreal to get connected around issues of racism, uh, class, uh, globalization, internationalization. You know, the list is, is really quite long. Some of the things that we've focused on, and it's been mentioned here in this session, is Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Indigenous inclusion. Um, so you'll see that through a pre-conference session, through featured speakers, uh, the keynote with Jack Saddleback. Um, we've also done a lot of things throughout the last 18 months working with uh, the, the Native American in Indigenous Network through CMA, the Commission, uh, the Coalition rather on Multicultural Awareness. Um, so there's a lot of places where we are trying to focus on being more inclusive. In, in addition, we're also trying to offer more services that we've offered in the past. So we've offer we're offering more all-gender inclusive um, washrooms. So it is washrooms instead of bathrooms in Canada. Um, washrooms are toilet. Um, so we're offering more all-gender washrooms than we ever have at any convention. Um, and so folks can find that on the website as well. But we have a, a whole host of resources that we've offer we're offering um, and information that we're offering that is different from previous conventions on the website under inclusion. So folks will see that typically inclusion has just been about access and accessibility. And we've broken that out to be much more specific about what type of inclusion are we hoping that people get when they're in Montreal for this particular ACPA convention. Um, so that, that's just a really quick highlight. But I, you know, I think that folks are going to see some of the things that we've built out um, here under the inclusion tab, hopefully carrying over to Columbus, in particular around Aboriginal and inclusion, Indigenous inclusion, um, and, and also with pronouns. Um, so that, really quickly, I hope that, that gives folks a, a, a starting place. Um, I, mean, I can't guarantee that we've gotten everything right, but that we are definitely uh, working in a work, a work in progress within the Equity and Inclusion Advisory Board around hopefully bringing more attention to things that, or identities and experiences that were not attended to in the past. Great. Thanks so much, Stephanie. That's great. Um, and I also noted that there is a whole section on the website. We keep referring to the website, but I think that that's a really important resource for folks to help um, understand. Um, so, Cindy, if you're not going to ACPA, you you're have to stay at home, you have a board meeting, your weather, something, something happens and you can't make it out of your hometown, um, as I'm getting 12 inches of snow outside my window today, um, can you talk about what the best way to access convention is for those who aren't on site? We've, we've heard a little bit about the digital pass, and I know we've had that in years past. What, what is it, and how do I get one? Oh, we are on, you're on mute, I think. Sorry. Okay. You can uh, access the digital pass by going to the convention website. So that's convention.myacpa.org. Click registration, and then one of the drop downs is digital pass. You follow the registration link to that purchase. The pricing is $99 for members and $49 for uh, student members. 
uh, non-members is 199 and non-member students is 99. The great thing about that pass, you'll get the opening session, uh, which was described just a moment ago. Sean Hopper, uh, we're also recording uh, his presidential symposium follow-up, which will be fabulous, and a number of sessions that will appear both live stream and then be recorded for redistribution on ACPA video on demand. So the cool thing is you don't have to miss convention uh, at all, really. You can participate either digitally, live, or wait until later and join in. All right, all right. so in the beginning, we talked about how we would um, give away a free digital pass to somebody on the uh, Twitterverse today. So if you are watching, um, please tweet us one thing that you learned from this webcast and include ACPA 16 and Higher Live, those two hashtags, and we'll draw from those people who tweet and award a free digital pass. Cool. So our, our final question to all of you is, is about attending the convention for the first time. And, and we know that a big national conference like this can be a daunting experience. So for each of you, in 30 seconds or less, what is the one thing that you wish you had done when you attended your first large conference? Let, let's go back in our original order. So uh, we'll go to Chris. Great. I, I thank you. I, I would say that if it doesn't say closed, go to it if it's interesting to you. Um, if it doesn't say closed, it is open to anyone and everyone that has interest. I wish I had, the, had done that and had the courage to, to do that. Great. Cindy? Well, we didn't have iPhones when I went to my first convention a thousand years ago, but if we had, I would have captured the name and image of as many people as I met as possible so I could follow up later in my network. Fabulous. Stephanie? Um, yeah, I. so this might sound a little bit silly, but I wish I would have um, gone to bed a little bit earlier and woken up a little er earlier um, so, to help me <laughs> catch some of the sessions that are earlier in the morning um, that I thought were really great, but uh, unfortunately my first experience um, may have slept past some time of sessions being available. Okay. And Rich? Um, connecting with people. Uh, I, you know, I was very new to uh, ACPA and I was the only one from my institution and I, I wish I was able to, to get over a bit of my shyness and, and connect with folks. Great. Rachel? Um, I think for me it would have been uh, making sure I was connected when I left. And so being in that with a commission or a, a coalition, entity group of some sort, with a new colleague or with ACP broadly, I think being that connection point would, would be the thing to do. Find some way to stay connected. Great. He Heather, how about you? You know, I agree with Rachel. I think the the convention is only one part of the larger ACPA experience, so if you get connected to a commission or coalition or a state chapter or international chapter, you have ongoing opportunities to connect to your network. So I think that's a great piece of advice. Great. Tony, what about you? Uh, my advice would be to get outside your comfort zone and, and try a new experience or go to a session that isn't typical of what you would normally go to or, or happens to be in your discipline. So really kind of grow like we challenge our students, get out of your comfort zone and, and find grow a little bit. That's great. Well, again, I want to thank all of you for being on Higher Live today, talking about ACPA. And thanks to everybody who was engaging in our back channel. We had some great uh, questions and great conversation. Uh, for folks who are listening to this as a podcast or later, please go back and look at the hashtag because I think there was some really informa good information that was tweeted out um, as well. So uh, thank you for all of you. Um, so we um, also want to thank our program sponsors. Among them is ACPA. So thank you mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. So coming up next week, um, or next, not next week actually, it's March 8th on Student Affairs Live, uh, Tony and I will be hosting an epic live event, which Stephanie alerted to earlier, um, live from Montreal, but it will be live streamed as well. Um, this is called Contested Issues in Student Affairs, and we will be featuring um, live on stage debates between Chris Wren, Patrick Love, Stan Carpenter, Sujin Jones, Zeb Davenport, Danielle Deswal, Keith Edwards, Gretchen Metzlars, Paul Brown, Ed Cabellan, Paul Shong, and Stacey Wharton Pearson. Pearson Wharton, sorry. 
Um, so we are tweeting out a link right now about that event, and uh, Tony and I are both really excited about it and hope that you all will watch online or attend in person. And if you want to see a sample of what that might look like, Heather and I had a little mock debate uh, a week ago, which I soundly won, by the way, by the tweet poll. Um, but we, did, we had some fun about the, um, whether video games was a sport or not. So if you want to get a taste of what that might look like, check it out. So I'll be back in March with a special episode on ending sexual assault with Ruth Ann Koenig, Holly Ryder Milkovich, and Jody Jessup Anger, who was one of the co-chairs of the ACPA Task Force uh, for Ending Sexual Violence. You can receive reminders about this and other great shows by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. You can also browse the archives at higheredlive.com or subscribe to our iTunes podcast. I'm Tony Duty. And I'm Heather Shea Gasser. Thanks for watching, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you all in Montreal. Thank you. <laughs>